He is one of the founding members of one of the most iconic early pioneers of American New Wave and punk music, Mr. Chris Stein of Blondie. Chris, how you doing, my friend? How you doing, Jeremy? What's going on? Good, man. Now, I know you, you grew up there in Brooklyn, New York, but what was the turning point in your personal life where you knew music was going to be such a huge part of it? Well, oh, I was always pretty deep into it on a fan level in the early days, in the 60s and everything. I was just, I even went to Woodstock, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I went to San Francisco in 67 in the summer, and the whole night, so I was always there through the, you know, early days. And then in the, when I was, I was in art school in New York, in the 70s and from there the music scene started beckoning and then and how did you meet up with uh, deborah harry and the rest of the guys in blondie how did that all come about well i met debbie early on she was with this band called the stilettos i went actually went to their first show and it was you know i was very impressed with her and i started playing with those guys and um it just it's full history the band self-titled debut album blondie in 1976 was home to one of the great hit singles that did very well over in australia uh called in the flesh in the the flip side, of course, to the to the single uh, "Ex Offender," um, and wasn't there like a slip up on an American or an Australian TV show that somebody played the wrong video or something like that? Yeah, well, it was Molly Meldrum on Countdown. Supposedly, the story was he. You know, yeah, he played the B side instead, and that got really popular. But I, am, you know, in retrospect, I've always thought he just had better judgment as to what would have been successful there, and they just called it a mistake. But I've, I've spoken to him about that, and he sort of denies it. So I, 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 I don't know. Huh? Weird. Yeah. I mean, the the forty fives. I guess they can get kind of confusing. <laughs> but that's well, so. The, but know, that's the one thing. The X Offender was like a fast punk song, and in the flesh was kind of a you know ballad, and it was it was at that time Australia was very different than it is nowadays. So it went. And, you know, it was a lot easier for something like that to come go across over the airwaves. Right, right. No, I understand. But but what a great thing is, I mean, you guys had, you know, Ex-Offender and In the Flesh is, you know, uh, great singles around the world. So that's a, that's a pretty good start right there. Yeah, yeah. No, it was exciting. It was an exciting period. And the song that really put you guys on the international music musical map was a great tune that landed at number one in six different countries and was a great song that you and uh, Deborah wrote called Heart of Glass. Uh, was that song originally written in 1975 and you guys had the had the title to it, uh, Once Once I Had a Love? That wasn't really the title. We just, we called it the disco song, and it was just sort of a more rock the boat baby type thing, you know. It was just it didn't have that electronica vibe at the time when we first were fooling around with it, and we just it's just, it just always on a back burner. And then we started when we started working with Mike Chapman, we sort of upgraded it. And for us, we were just trying to sound like Kraftwerk or something. And but it, it slipped into the disco world very easily. The last single, uh, Chris, from the album uh, Parallel Lines, was a great track called One Way or Another. Now, I, and I've heard. I've heard different stories that was that inspired by a real life uh, incident for Deborah? Oh yeah, yeah, a little bit of stalking stuff. Yeah, like when I met her, she had this guy that was stalking her and stuff like that. So I mean, you know, it's not th- that specific, but there's uh, there are elements of it that are inspired by real life. And then of course they they released your tune Sunday Girl over in the UK, right? Yeah, that was number one in the UK. Yeah. How did you come up with Sunday Girl? Sunday Girl was about Debbie's cat who, who was named Sunday Man who ran away. Right, and and I and I remember when I was growing up as a kid, uh, you guys released the great album "Eat the Beat," and I always remember listening to it in my room and and hearing the record needles slide down onto the record. And the first song we all heard was a great track that you wrote with Deborah called "Dreaming." How did you guys put that tune together? Um, Dreaming is a little inspired by Dancing Queen. If you listen to Dancing Queen, you'll you'll hear elements of the melody, you know, being copped in there. Okay, interesting. All right. But how, you know, we just we it just came together with the way a lot of those things. We probably it was a little different. The original, the Clem put those crazy drums on it. I had thought of it more as just as a four sort of a straight ahead beat, and he he put those you know bouncing drums on it. And the uh, the Grammy nominated tune "Call Me" wasn't released on any of the original Blondie albums, but of course you guys did have the great opportunity to have it be released as part of the Richard Gere movie soundtrack to American Gigolo. How did that all come about? Um, I. So, you know, I don't really remember who got us in touch with who, but we did get to meet Paul Schrader and Gear and all those guys. I even I took Gear to buy a guitar, actually, in New York City around that period. And I remember telling the guys in the guitar store, look, this guy's going to be a big star. And they were like, okay, yeah, who cares, whatever. <laughs> and, um, you know, and Paul Schrader is the guy who wrote Taxi Driver. He, you know, directed Gigolo. It was a, it was a great period. We were lucky enough to be able to brush you know, elbows with a lot of those Hollywood people from the uh, 60s and 70s. And speaking of the 60s and 70s, the follow-up to Call Me was a, a great town, a great tune called uh, Atomic. Did Ellie Greenrich uh, sing back up on that tune? 
gee, I don't know. You know, it's possible. I, um, Ellie, Ellie's on the first record. She's on In the Flesh. Uh, I don't know if that's her on Atomic. I'm not sure. There is. There may be backups on that. I, I'm, I'm blanking on it. Okay. She, she's on In the Flesh, the one that was the hit in Australia. Right. Okay. Yeah. I just I've heard through different sources that she was there doing backup for you guys. Um, it's possible. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Because that was probably cut in New York. Huh. We only did the one album in L.A. was the um, Auto American album. Uh, the Tide is High originally, was that written back in the 1930s? No, that's from the, probably the 60s. That's by John Holt wrote that. That's, and there was a band called the Paragons. And a friend of mine sent me a reggae compilation record, and that the original version of that was on, and I just thought it was amazing. And all the horn lines are based on the violin line. And oddly, that, that's a track that has a violin player on it, which is really weird for a reggae song. And, you know, we just evolved it out of that. Okay, and, and, the, and I was told that the percussion uh, included eight tracks of drumsticks banking on a uh, piano bench? Yeah, well, that sounds right, you know, all that kind of stuff. We played everything over the years. Uh, those water cooler bottles were also popular. I don't know if they're any around that, but those things have a great sound sometimes. And taken from that album, uh, Auto American, uh, was another beautiful track that uh, you co-wrote uh, with Deborah, uh, Rapture. How did you guys come up with the idea to actually add the rap to that? Because that became like one of the first number one hits to have a rap to it. Yeah, some of the guys from Wu-Tang Clan told us that, that it was the first rap song they ever heard, which is kind of mind-boggling. But it was, you know, we had just been to a rap gig. Freddie, uh, Fab Five Freddie took us to a gig in, in 77 in the South Bronx, and it was really, it was just a really exciting scene. And I, I spent a lot of time at a lot of meetings with people from the record industry trying to convince them that it wasn't a fad and it was going to go away. And, that, and almost 100% of them told me that. Really? That's too funny. Wow. Because, I mean, I mean, the hip-hop scene and, and rap was, I mean, pretty big there in New York City, even in the early 80s. Yeah, by the early 80s, it was broke wide open. But, right. But, it's, you know, it really paralleled the New York underground scene. It started around, you know, early 70s, 72, 73, and started coming up all through the late 70s. Yeah, because, I mean, you guys were big over in, you know, Australia and the U.K., and you guys were kind of known as a as an underground band here in the States. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, sure. And so, Chris, what are you personally working on as far as projects yourself? Are you just strictly working with Blondie, or what's going on these days? Yeah, I'm working on songs all the time. I'm just always working on music. I just got my photographs up online on the Morrison Hotel Gallery, if you know what that is. It's a big rock photography site. So um, that's about it, you know, this and that. A few things on the back burner. Mostly music. I'm just working on music all the time. It's always a good thing, Chris. Always a good thing. Really appreciate Thanks it. For, thanks for having me on.